You've probably come across this little guy at some point in your life. It's the fundamental building block of all matter, and it's really tiny. Millions of these things could fit on the head of a pin, and it's composed of even tinier things called protons, neutrons, and electrons. This lesson is all about the atom. So what are we going to learn in this lesson? Well, first we'll learn about the structure of the atom, and then we're going to learn about some numbers on the periodic table that help to describe atoms of a particular element. And then finally, we'll learn about isotopes. There have been many discoveries that have contributed to our understanding of the atom, and we can't explore all of them in this lesson. It would just be way too long. So we'll skip to the end and learn about what we know about the structure of the atom at this point. It's called the modern atomic theory. First, the atom is composed of three subatomic particles called protons, neutrons, and electrons. These particles are extremely small, and they have incredibly small amounts of mass. The proton has a mass of 1.66 times 10 to the negative 27 kilograms. These masses are so small that scientists created a new unit to take their place, called the atomic mass unit. Protons and neutrons have essentially the same mass, and so they have a mass of 1 amu each. Protons and neutrons are quite large compared to the electron. The electron is so small, in fact, that it has a mass of 0 amu. Protons have a positive charge, neutrons have no charge, and an electron has a negative charge. So where are these particles? Well, protons and neutrons reside in the nucleus of the atom. This is a really dense center of the atom. We know that the atom is really small, but the nucleus only accounts for a tiny percentage of the atom's volume. The atom is mostly empty space, and actually 99.9% .9 of the atom is empty space. If the atom was the size of a football stadium, the nucleus would be the size of a blueberry at the very center of the field. And then what about the electrons? Well, they would be flying around the outside of the atom, somewhere up in the seat somewhere. Now, there are a variety of models that we use to describe where the electrons are. The simplest model is called the Bohr model. The Bohr model puts the electrons into energy levels that look like the orbits of planets in a solar system. There are three numbers that are used to describe the atoms of a particular element. They are the atomic number, the mass number, and the atomic weight. The number of protons is what makes each atom unique. And on the periodic table, the number of protons in the nucleus of an atom is given by this number right here, called the atomic number. The atomic number can be used to identify the element. Hydrogen has one proton, so its atomic number is one. And helium has two protons, so its atomic number is two. And zirconium has 40 protons, and its atomic number is 40. In a neutral atom, that is, an atom that does not have an overall positive or negative charge, the number of protons will be equal to the number of electrons. And so the atomic number can tell us the number of protons, and it can also tell us the number of electrons. Remember that protons are positive and electrons are negative. So since helium has two protons and it has two electrons, the two positive charge and the two negative charge will cancel each other out, making the atom neutral. An atom cannot gain or lose protons because it would become a completely different kind of atom. If hydrogen gained an extra proton, for example, it would no longer be hydrogen because its atomic number would now be 2 instead of 1. It would be helium, not hydrogen. Electrons, on the other hand, are gained and lost all the time. If hydrogen gained an extra electron, it would still be hydrogen because it still just has one proton. The atomic number is still 1 but the number of electrons increased from one electron to two electrons. The number of protons and electrons wouldn't be equal anymore. There is only one proton, but two electrons. So hydrogen would have an overall negative one charge. We just add up the charges. One proton, so plus one, and add that to two electrons, two minus equals negative one. Atoms that have gained or lost electrons are called ions. Ions will have a positive charge or a negative charge. Ions with a positive charge are called cations, and ions with a negative charge are called anions. So why would an atom lose or gain electrons? They are trying to obey the octet rule. This is a rule that states in general, atoms want to have eight electrons in their outermost energy level. So remember Bohr's diagram, we're talking about the outermost ring. So electrons are moving around the nucleus in certain allowed energy levels. And it kind of works like the steps of a ladder. Electrons cannot exist between energy levels. They have to be on one of those energy levels. Now we're going to learn a lot more about the Bohr model in the next lesson. For now, we'll just understand the basics of it. The first energy level can hold a maximum of two electrons. And then each energy level after that can hold eight electrons. Atoms want to have a full valence shell. Valence shell means the outermost energy level. 
there's a quick method to determine the number of valence electrons in an atom. For the representative elements, that's these ones right here, the ones that are numbered, the number of valence electrons will be the same as the group number. So everything here in group one has one valence electron, that is one electron in their outermost energy level. Group two has two, and then we skip over the middle section here. These elements don't follow this trend. So over here is group three. They have three valence electrons, and so on. The last column is group eight, and they have eight valence electrons, except for helium, which only has two valence electrons. They all have a full valence shell, and so these elements don't really want to react with anything because they already have a complete valence shell. Elements that are close to getting eight, like group five, six, and seven, will gain the extra electrons they need to get eight. So phosphorus, for example, has five valence electrons, and so it will gain three electrons to have eight. Elements that are far from having eight, like groups one, two, or three, well, they're going to lose their electrons to get eight. It seems counterproductive to lose electrons in order to fill a valence shell. But check out sodium. Sodium has one valence electron, but it has a total of 11 electrons. Here's what the Bohr diagram looks like for sodium. Sodium has two electrons in the first level, eight electrons in the second level, and then just one in the third level. So if sodium loses a single valence electron, it will have a whole new shell underneath that has eight valence electrons. That's why these elements will lose their electrons. Atoms don't really lose or gain protons and neutrons, but they do gain and lose electrons all the time according to the octet rule. The next number that describes an atom is called the mass number. The mass number of an element tells us how much mass the atom has. Remember that electrons are so small that they don't have any mass. They have a mass of zero AMU. So only protons and neutrons give mass to the atom. The mass number is equal to the number of protons plus the number of neutrons. An atom of fluorine has 9 protons and 10 neutrons. So what is the mass number? Well, it would be 19 AMU. We just added the two together. There are other kinds of fluorine. Remember that for an atom to be fluorine, the atom must have 9 protons because the atomic number of fluorine is 9. The number of neutrons, however, can vary. There is one kind of fluorine that has 9 protons and 9 neutrons. So its mass number would be 18 AMU. These are both fluorine because they have 9 protons, but they have different masses. Atoms that have the same number of protons, but different number of neutrons are called isotopes. So fluorine-19 and fluorine-18 are isotopes of fluorine. There's another number on the periodic table called the atomic weight, also known as the atomic mass. This is the average mass of all the different naturally occurring isotopes of that particular element. The atomic mass of fluorine is 18.998. Since this average of all different types of fluorine is so close to 19, it tells us that the most abundant fluorine in the universe has a mass of 19. It's the fluorine 19 isotope. To calculate the atomic mass, we take the weighted average of all the different types. Here's an example. Chlorine has two isotopes, chlorine 35 and chlorine 37. The percent abundance of chlorine 35 is 75.77% and the percent abundance of chlorine 37 is 24.23%. What is the atomic weight of chlorine? Weighted averages work like this. Multiply the mass of the first isotope by its percentage, and then multiply the mass of the second isotope by its percentage, and then add the two answers together. When you multiply by a percentage, you need to use the decimal form of the percentage. So you divide the percentage by 100 to get the decimal form. 35 AMU times 0.7577 and then we'll add that to 37 AMU times 24.23, and we get 35.45 AMU. So 35.45 is the weighted average, in other words, the atomic weight of chlorine. So did you learn everything in this lesson? Well, if you did, you learned that an atom is composed of protons, neutrons, and electrons. The number of protons is what makes an atom unique from another atom, but atoms can gain or lose electrons. The atomic number is the number of protons in the nucleus of an atom, and the mass number is the number of protons plus the number of neutrons. Isotopes are atoms with the same number of protons but different number of neutrons.